Today, I'm attempting to go as far down the rabbit hole as we can, breaking down the various mythological inspirations for Haspen Hotel and Hell of a Boss, exploring how the mythology of the two shows connect, and what we can theorize about based on the pieces we have. My name is Imcut, hit that subscribe button, and let's jump into it. Hasbin Hotel and Hell of a Boss both take place in the same universe, but are two very different shows meant to explore two very different facets of Vipsy Pop's world. Hasbin Hotel was of course conceived of first, with all of Hell being just this world with the red sky with heaven floating above it that we see in the background. Its central conflict was between the sinners who had lived a life on Earth before dying and manifesting as a demon in Hell, and the angels as a whole. The angels include natural born entities as well as, like the sinners, people who had once lived on Earth before dying and manifesting as an angel in Heaven. Hell of a Boss's characters started as minor side characters for Hasbin Hotel, with Blitz and Moxie being described as two little troublemakers who were constantly harassing the hotel. Hasbin Hotel was seen as overflowing with characters at this point from what I understand, so those two were moved to their own spin-off series, where they would produce a total of 16 episodes before Hasbin Hotel would finally complete production and make it to Amazon Prime with its 8 episodes. Originally, Hell of a Boss was meant to explore the Earth more than Hell, with the series being predicated on Blitz and his team going up to Earth to kill humans on behalf of sinners in Hell who want revenge. At some point, however, the focus would switch from Earth to six new locations within Hell. The pilot had presented Hell as just one red planet made essentially for the sinners, but many fans had already been asking if Hell would end up having nine circles to it, the way it is described in the works of Dante, which explored both Hell and Heaven. Vivzy Pop also seemed to like this idea, but instead chose to make them seven rings of hell instead of nine circles, based instead on the seven deadly sins. For this structure, Vivzy Pop borrowed from the Peter Binsfield classification of demons, which lists seven demonic princes ruling over hell, embodying those seven sins. Lucifer was already a character planned as Charlie's father in Hasbin Hotel at this point, and in this particular hierarchy, he was listed as the ruler of pride. The location we previously thought of as Hell then became what we now call the Pride Ring, the uppermost ring of Hell, and Hell of a Boss would focus more so on exploring the six other rings of Hell. Since Hasbin Hotel was primarily about the sinners and the angels, Hell of a Boss went to explore the native species that exist in Hell, such as imps, hellhounds, and succubus. Unlike sinners, these entities are born in Hell and grow and develop there the way humans do on Earth. While they live somewhat longer than humans, they are not immortal the way the sinners are and will die of old age if they manage to survive not dying by violence or some other way. This makes Hell of a Boss and Has Been Hotel two very different shows that help fill out two very different parts of the same world. To limit how much the stories can affect each other, the sinners are restricted only to the pride ring with its red sky, and they are not allowed to travel down to the lower six rings of hell. These areas are safe havens for the mortal species, where they don't have to interact with the immortal earthborn sinners, who are listed as being higher in hell's hierarchy because of their immortality. Now, I'm ready to start breaking down the real life mythology behind all of this, but real quick, the word myth and mythology is not offensive to practicing religions, nor does it imply that they are untrue. Mythology simply refers to the stories of the origins of people and divine entities. It was used in the Greek equivalent of the Bible, Hesiod's Theogony, to refer to its own stories. Comparative mythology thus has always been a term that could be used for comparing the origins of the various stories found all over the world, not to call one or all of them fictional, but often to try and prove the historicity of each of them. I've been asked to use the word religion instead, but of course people already complain when I bring up myths from outside the religious canon, as I'm going to be talking about mythology as a whole and not just what's considered canon to various religions. Nor is theology really appropriate because we only rope in theology when it matches mythology instead of theology based on what is considered canon, which can contradict mythology. The idea that the word myth is being used to imply fiction is just because some people have used the phrase just a myth to try and claim certain narratives are just stories instead of having a greater meaning, but the word myth has not lost its nuance because of that. So in short, there is no reason to be offended by the word myth, as to mythologize is to simply add metaphors to explain more truths in addition to a more literal story. This is why we have four different gospels telling differing accounts of the life of Christ, as we can acknowledge the obvious shared history and see where the different accounts were mythologized to highlight still very true points. And why you'll still hear me saying Christian mythology while still being a strong believer in Christ, as well as someone who does their best in order to put up all 
different faiths and even the mythologies of lost cultures into the spotlight for everyone to see their inherent truths. Now, hell and heaven may seem like opposites of each other on the surface, but it's made very clear that heaven was its own prosperous place for quite some time before hell even came into existence. Additionally, Vivzipop had said in early livestream interviews that heaven will not be an inversion of hell. Hence, there won't be seven rings to heaven, each modeled after one of these seven heavenly virtues. And while Hell of a Boss presents the angelic cherubs as being a parallel to the imps of hell, that does not mean that all demonic species have some sort of counterpart in heaven of equal status or anything like that. According to Charlie's story, in the very beginning there was just heaven, where many angels lived to worship the concept of good and to shield existence from the concept of evil. These angels had existed for some time as there was one group called the Elders, and they had the power and authority to, at least to some degree, shield the projects from younger entities like Lucifer, whose ideas were considered too dangerous. As of now, there isn't a strict class ranking system for these angels, as outside of the sinners, only the Seraphim are explicitly named. Seraphs are often considered the highest ranking angels in various real-life writings, as in the Bible they are described as simply surrounding God and singing his praises. Seraphim translates as fiery ones or burning ones, hence why Lucifer, meaning light bringer, is often believed to be a seraph. The term seraph is also used to describe serpents that attack the Israelites in the Bible, and thus Lucifer in the show also takes the form of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. In addition to this, we see other angels such as Ophanim, with Ofa meaning wheels, so Ophanim meaning wheels within wheels. And of course, in Hell of a Boss, we have the cherubs, which are not like their biblical counterparts, but rather cute baby animals like in later Christian artwork. Now, the show is known for diverging from the typical interpretation of Genesis, but even in the origins of human creation, it's very different from what we normally think of when reading the Bible. In the Bible, there are six days of creation, over which God is said to make the heaven and the earth, saving humans for last on day six, and then resting on the seventh day. In the original Hebrew, however, the term used that we translate as God here is Elohim. Elohim comes from the root word El, which was the name of the chief deity of the ancient Near Eastern religions that Judaism developed out of. And I am in Hebrew denotes a plurality, and thus Elohim translates not just as God, but also as counsel of God, depending on the context. Before turning to monotheism, the people of Judea would have had a mythology similar to those it developed out of, such as the Ugarites. In their mythology, El is that chief god, and he is surrounded by a group called the Elim, or or the Council of El. While El was the chief god, Elim could be used to describe the actions of the deities collectively, whose goals were generally geared around that of El. In Judaism, a process of monotheization would occur, wherein the word Elohim is believed to have become more popular over time because it slowly was able to reduce the names of those other different gods beneath El into a singular council, lacking particular identities, maintaining their purpose in the stories as helpers to a chief god without them being gods that you are meant to worship. And this is how we got our idea of divine angels today. In other chapters of the Bible, God will be referred to by his Hebrew name Yahweh, which we translate in our English versions as Lord, which is often just another way to refer to God, but which can sometimes remove the nuance of the word Elohim in the original Hebrew. While we translate Elohim as God in the story of the six days of creation, there are moments where this God refers to multiple entities around him, which we know that he sees as separate from himself because he then is referred to with more singular pronouns afterwards. It is when God is supposedly creating humans that this happens, with him saying, let's make man in our image, indicating a group of beings like him, that council that surrounds El. But then when he goes on to do the process of actually making man, it says that Elohim then made man in his image instead of their image, like he said when announcing his plan to the others. This makes sense in the original Hebrew, as in other parts of the Bible, God, Elohim, is also described as standing among his council, which is still titled Elohim. So we know that the Hebrews could use this word right next to itself with different contexts. Therefore, from that, we can see that the ancient Hebrews would use the word 
Elohim, not just with different contexts twice in the same story, but even in the same sentence. Thus, when it says God created the heavens and the earth in the Bible, some traditions would translate Elohim instead as angels creating the heavens and the earth on behalf of God. This was, at one time in history, meant to give reverence to the tribal gods beneath El who were being erased, acknowledging their place in history as forming civilizations as they knew it in the early world, while also making sure they weren't worshipped as part of the ultimate god. So the angels making the humans on Earth in Hasbin Hotel becomes the first of many changes to the modern understanding of the Bible that we have that instead hail back to older traditions and interpretations, though it doesn't stop there. In the second story of the Bible, after the initial creation of both man and woman, we get something of a second creation story, the Garden of Eden. While these are presented as two different creation accounts, it seems likely that the people who compiled the two stories together in the book of Genesis likely acknowledge them as focusing on separate ideas of creation. The six days of creation is more cosmic, being the events that lead up to humanity. And thus the Eden story, while retelling the creation of man and contradicting the order of certain things in creation, focuses more so on the beginnings of human history. In the Garden of Eden narrative, Adam is said to be created from the dust of the earth, and thus fails to find a partner for himself among the animals, who all have their own mates already. God then makes Eve out of the rib or side of Adam, depending on your translation, to be the perfect helpmate to him. The two are then told to tend to the garden for God and to eat of any fruit of the trees other than of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Despite this, the serpent tricks Eve into eating the fruit, as well as Adam, though the story emphasizes Eve's role in this through her conversation with the serpent, and Adam even blames Eve when God asks Adam why he ate the fruit. The show went about this very differently, of course, with Adam first being created from the dust of the earth with another woman named Lilith. Because of this, Lilith saw the two of them as no different from each other, equals essentially, but Adam still wanted Lilith to be subservient to him. Because of this, she fled the Garden of Eden, where she meets Lucifer. Together, they infiltrate the Garden of Eden, with Lucifer taking the form of the serpent, where he gives Eve free will through a fruit of knowledge. So, why did the show make these changes? There is a long-standing Jewish tradition that Eve is not actually Adam's first wife, but that he had another wife named Lilith before her. This isn't true or untrue per se, but rather, when this kind of claim is made, there is something being said in very mythological terms, a distinction being made that hails from an older tradition that the story of Adam and Eve itself first came from. In the actual writing of Genesis, there is clearly no room for Lilith, and was not written by a culture that understood a Lilith character in the context of Adam's wife being made from the same dust as him. Adam is made from the dust of the earth alone in this account, and given a chance to choose a helpmate from the other animals first. It is after not finding one among the animals that God realizes that man needs someone equal to him, and this is why Eve is made from his side. This was not to be more subservient than Lilith, as her tradition would claim, but because she was in fact Adam's equal. Lilith instead started as a demonic figure in other ancient cultures that the people of Judea would come in contact with where Lilith was known as an owl demon who was responsible for the death of pregnant women and their newborn babies. This was a common enough idea around the world where the death of pregnant women and young infants was hard to reconcile as part of a good god's plan, and where a character like Lilith would be able to take the blame. Lilith became understood as a cursed woman who had lost her own children, and thus began to haunt other expectant mothers so others could feel her own pain. As time would go on, she would be given more grand origins, her power stemming from her her being one of the first women to ever lose a child in birth, and then later, the first woman ever. The first time this was seen overtly in a Jewish text would be in the alphabet of Ben Sirach. This was a medieval text that adapted some of the existing oral history surrounding the Book of Genesis and Lilith that wasn't designed to be faithful to the tradition, but instead to play with some of its ideas in new ways. Here, Lilith is presented as the wife of Adam made from the same dust as him, neither wants to be the passive partner sexually. As for one to be the partner who lays down would be to imply that they were lesser than the other, despite being made from the same dust. Lilith flees from the garden to not have to deal with Adam, but God sends three angels to bring her back, giving her the choice of returning with them, or having to see 100 of her children killed every day, imagery similar to that of the annual extermination in Hasbin Hotel, where angels come down to kill Lilith's citizens. This is what leads Lilith to become a haunter of pregnant women and young infants. 
Originally, it would seem that the idea of Adam and the name of Lilith were entirely separate mythologically, being different mythos meant to explain different things. But as Lilith's story of being the mother without children slowly grew to her being the first mother ever, this text managed to marry the ideas together, so to speak. Over the next 500 years after the alphabet of Ben Sirach would become popularized, the oral tradition involving Lilith would evolve with this new narrative in mind. Eve, as a mythological figure, has gone back and forth from being one of great reverence to one of great derision. In both Judaism and Christianity, she has been seen as the mother of all humans, who was an innocent victim of sabotage, to the originator of all evil because of her act of eating the fruit, with all women after her being cursed because of this. In an attempt to maintain the more pure image of Eve as a victim, as a mother we all look up to, Lilith would begin to take on more of the dark aspects of Eve's symbolic place in history, as per the story of Genesis. In the 13th century, the Jewish Kabbalistic text the Zohar would surface, which acts as a sort of key to decode the stories of the Torah, or what most Christians know as the first five books of the Bible. This text was claimed to be written much earlier, in the very first century of Christianity, and was written as a transcribed series of conversations between famous rabbis of the time. These rabbis would often have seemingly contradictory claims, but in these narratives, you could see how, side by side, these contradictions point out what the real similarities are, showing more so the evolution of symbols in Jewish storytelling while unraveling their shared origins. At this point, Lilith had evolved not just to being the first wife of Adam, but after fleeing from the Garden of Eden, she ends up marrying a fallen angel named Samael. Samael is described in the Zohar as a sort of unifying figure representing the tribe of fallen angels from the earlier Book of Enoch. This text is dated to the centuries before Christ, but sometime after the compilation of the Book of Genesis as we know it. The story elaborated on the details found in the Book of Genesis, particularly leading up to the Great Flood and Noah's Ark. Here, Noah's ancestor Enoch is given a vision of the origins and eventual destruction of the race of beings known as the Nephilim, giants who covered the world before the flood and were the descendants of the sons of God. The sons of God, translated from sons of Elohim, were angelic beings sent down to watch over humans, but who rebelled against God by taking human wives and giving forbidden knowledge to them that they then passed down to their giant offspring. In the Zohar, these angels are unified by the character of Samael, and then connected to the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Samael is explained as riding the serpent into Eden in order to seduce Eve after taking Lilith as his wife. This role in the show is played by Lucifer, who married Lilith like Samael, entered the Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent, and then gave Eve the fruit of forbidden knowledge. Now, Lucifer is essentially the Christian version of Samael, but when that sort of thing is said, I'm not saying that Christians looked at the character of Samael specifically from the Zohar and said, let's call him Lucifer. Instead, Lucifer's name first appeared in the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible from the 4th century AD. This was done for a primarily Roman audience, and thus, when it came time to translate certain passages that referenced Near Eastern mythology that surrounded Judaism, it made sense to fill in the gaps with figures Romans would be more familiar with. This passage I'm referring to is Isaiah 14, which describes a Babylonian king and how he has displeased God. He is described as being like Halal ben Shahar, or Don, son of morning, which in the ancient Near East appeared to be a reference to Venus. Venus is closer to the sun than we are, so for about nine months at a time, Venus can be seen trailing behind the sun after it sets, becoming visible for only a short while before it follows the sun under the horizon. During this period, Venus was generally referred to as the Evening Star by various different cultures. Over the latter half of those nine months, Venus would get closer to the Sun from our perspective, with a period near the end where it isn't visible to us at all. But for about nine months after that, Venus would be visible only in the morning, rising before the Sun, and being visible for only a short while before the Sun came up over the horizon and blocked it out with its great light. During this period, Venus is referred to as the Morning Star, hence why Lucifer is named Lucifer Morningstar in the show. The motions of the stars were often used as a story structure to help apply history and myth to for ancient people, with different cultures using the same motions to tell different kinds of stories based off of what they had actually experienced. In Rome, Lucifer, meaning Lightbringer, was seen as a being that signaled the rise of the sun. He was a sort of child of the sun who helped it rise every morning. This wasn't a part of Rome's practical religion or mythology, with Venus being a female goddess in their more overt religious systems. With this story of Lucifer, 
Lucifer being a star that pulled the sun around being more what we think of today as a fairy tale that was meant to help people learn more about astronomy. Now, before the translation of Lucifer, my understanding was this passage was something already heavily examined by Greek scholars, both after and before the spread of Christianity. Greek or Hellenistic readers of the Old Testament saw this mention in Isaiah as a sort of lost lore of the ancient Israelites. It presented Venus as a more negative entity, one who tries to outshine the sun by rising before it before being defeated by the sun in the end. In the Ugaritic mythology of the Baal cycle, this plays out with the god Athar, who represents Venus, trying to ascend to the throne of previous gods that had been knocked down. This is an example of the motions of a planet like Venus being used to help remember local history, with this myth of a Venus-like god trying to ascend to the throne and failing, matching the actions of a tribe that had tried to rise to power in the area in the past. This was a common motif in older mythologies because of such events. Before the time of Jesus, when the Jewish Old Testament was being translated into Greek, the Book of Enoch would be translated as well, and thus their scholars would identify the Venus figure of Isaiah 14 with the tribe of fallen angels from the Book of Enoch, and centuries later, the name Lucifer would be attached to that during the Latin translation. A more unique entity within Hasbin Hotel is Charlie, who is half angel on her father's side, but also half human on her mother's side, though her story is not just similar to the supposed children of Lilith in Jewish lore, who is the mother of all demons, but to the supposed children of Eve and the serpent as well. As mentioned earlier, the Zohar equates the story of the Garden of Eden with the Book of Enoch, and thus Eve is depicted in the Zohar as being impregnated by the fallen angel who gave her forbidden knowledge, Samael. This is why the actual Garden of Eden narrative has God telling Eve that her descendants and the descendants of the serpent will have enmity with each other, following which we get the story of Cain and Abel. The Zohar confirms that in the Jewish tradition, Cain was interpreted as the son of the serpent, hence why he killed his brother Abel, who was born of Eve and Adam instead of Eve and the serpent. Cain's descendants are even referred to as the sons of God and Nephilim, with them being described as looking like the humans below as well as the angels above because of their father's male. Lilith and Eve both thus essentially tell the same story of being the earliest of women, with Lilith focusing on the parts of Eve's story where women married fallen angels and gave birth to a race of giants or demons called Nephilim. It is the act of giving free will to Eve that creates hell, with Charlie explaining that this opens up a new realm of darkness, a pit that Lucifer and Lilith are cast into, as Lucifer is viewed as creating this pit. Before this, it was assumed that all souls would manifest in heaven, I guess, with no hell for these souls to go to instead. This parallels how, through the guidance of watchers from the Book of Enoch, the humans would not have fallen into a state of sin, with the state of hell being seen in Christianity as a sort of mistake that Jesus has been sent down to fix. After his death on the cross, he is said to descend into the afterlife to rescue the souls that are trapped there, with later stories depicting him as rescuing even the patriarchs being trapped there. Early in the storybook narration, the angels are said to worship good and shield the world from evil, both of whom seem to be personifications, embodiments, entities that can take form instead of just ideas. Existence thus was a place made safe by the angels who were trying to prevent the entity of evil from seeping into reality, and Lucifer ruined that. He didn't just doom many souls to hell with his actions, but he made it so that the essence of evil itself could create its own darker reality in hell, its own life forms that mirror that on earth in dark and twisted ways. And it has given evil the opportunity to take over Earth itself, as we will explore later in the video. In Hasbin Hotel, the primary focus is of course the sinners, who, thanks to Lucifer, manifest in hell with a form that reflects their sinful life on Earth. Until recently, this was assumed to be a permanent punishment, as souls are immortal when they reach heaven or hell, and a death without an angelic weapon just leads to them regenerating where they already live. However, Serpentius proved that somehow, quite possibly through actually redeeming himself, that a death in hell can lead to you manifesting again in heaven as an actual angel. However, in addition to creating a hellscape for the sinners, there are also those native species of hell as well, and more demonic royals who we aren't entirely sure if they are angels like Lucifer, or more powerful native species. But we'll be breaking all of that down as we descend into the lower six rings of hell to explore the two forms of demonic nobility. These are referred to in the show as the Seven Sins and the Ars Goetia. 
These seven sins, as discussed earlier, are modeled after the real-life seven deadly sins, and a particular demonology associated with Peter Binsfield. This 1500s theologian was known for his part in torturing people that he claimed were witches, women, men, and even children. Peter Binsfield claimed that after torturing these people, they gave him this list of demons as the royal hierarchy of hell. However, it matches other demon lists from the centuries before, such as the earlier Lantern of Light, which was also about these seven sins, but with some of the names being shuffled or different demon names being used entirely. The Ars Goetia, on the other hand, was a demonology found in the 1600s text called The Lesser Key of Solomon. This featured a total of 72 demons, ranging from the high-ranking kings to the lower princes, dukes, and marquis, written in different times by different people with different influences. They can have different ideas about what each demon most embodies or how the hierarchies work, but Hasbin Hotel and Hell of a Boss do a beautiful job of marrying those ideas together in their extended mythos. Now, below the world we see in Hasbin Hotel with its red sky are the other six rings of hell, each having their own species native there and its own differently colored sky and an almost rainbow-like pattern. Hell of a Boss focuses on showing us the other rings, which are not seen at all so far in Hasbin Hotel, since the sinners are restricted to the Pride Ring. This isn't explained in world, but it is assumed that, outside of making sure that the two stories don't have too much overlap, the choice to make sinners restricted to the Pride Ring would be so that Lucifer in particular will have responsibility over them, as they are in Hell because of Lucifer, with the other natives not necessarily wanting to deal with the sinners. Because the sinners are immortal, they can easily push out the lower species and other rings if given access, and could ultimately enslave them generationally if not for the sinners being restricted to pride. The closest we get to seeing the other rings in Hasbin Hotel is in Lucifer's room, where we see a map of the seven rings of hell hanging on his wall, with the red ring, pride, being his ring at the very top. In early live streams, Vizipop gave an off-handed hierarchy showing the power ranking of different groups in Hell. At the very bottom were the shortest lifespan natives, the Imps and Hellhounds. Above them are other common species from the other rings, followed by the Sinners, who rank higher because of their immortality, even though they are restricted to just one ring. Above the Sinners are the Overlords, who are generally just Sinners who have accumulated a lot of power due to demonic deals, where one demon gives his soul and its power to another demon in exchange for some sort of favor or arrangement. Above the overlords are the Ars Goetia, followed by the other six sins, who are outranked by Charlie and Lilith. Charlie and Lilith are said to get their power directly from Lucifer, who as a high-class angel massively outranks the other six sins so much that Charlie and a human like Lilith can still overpower them with the secondhand magic that he shares with them. Just below Pride with its red sky is the Wrath Ring with its orange sky, known to be ruled by Satan, though we haven't seen him on screen yet. Instead, we mostly know of him from the constant references the imps make to him. While imps are found all over hell, it seems their origin is in the Wrath Ring, where they revere Satan like a god, using Satan as an exclamation instead of God or even Lucifer. Now, while the Peter Binsfield classification and other schools of thought have shown Satan to be a separate entity from Lucifer, they were often considered the same figure in history, both being names and traditions that ended up tied to what we might call the devil figure. Whereas Lucifer's name originated from that fabled Roman figure of Venus as described before, Satan came first from the Old Testament Book of Job. In this story, God talks about the sons of Elohim, a term that was used to describe those fallen angels from the Book of Enoch, but which we know to be angelic because it also is used to describe the angels who interact directly with God in various Bible stories like this one. Here, Hasatan, which translates as the adversary, is welcomed among the sons of God, where he begins to question the purity of one of God's people, Job. God gives Hasatan permission to test Job, taking away everything Job has, but so that in the end, both Job and Hasatan will realize the full extent of what humans are capable of. While our culture likes to act like this was some sort of bet being made between between God and some evil entity, that idea would actually develop much later, with Hasatan in the text being more so an ignorant child of God who, like humans, needs to learn by experience. The title of Hasatan translates as the accuser and the adversary, reflecting how this particular son of God accused Job of not being worthy and ultimately became his adversary to test God's claims. In Greek, this would translate as diabolos, meaning slanderer or accuser, and over time would evolve to the word devil. 
The identity of Hasatan would evolve in the centuries after the Book of Job was first written, and before the time of Christ, Satan or the devil would be reinterpreted as the entity we see him as in the New Testament. Here, the devil figure is referred to both as Diabolos and Satan, using the Satan of the original Hebrew as a sort of alternate title for him in the same text. The Book of Job is believed to be among the earliest of the Old Testament stories to be written down, and there are comparisons made within the Zohar that, in my opinion, highlight how the Sons of God narrative from the Book of Enoch is actually an evolution of the story of the Book of Job. In the Zohar, interactions between the Sons of God and God himself are described from before the Sons of God were sent down to Earth. Here, they act like the Hasatan of Job, insisting humans are not worthy of the blessing God gives them. God insists, however, that the angels would sin even more than the humans, and they are then sent down with the mission to teach humans, with God knowing that they will succumb to the nature of matter and end up sinning in rebellion. Satan thus, while having different origins from Lucifer, is very much tied to the actual fallen angel narrative, hence why the New Testament showed Satan as the dark king of earth trying to tempt Jesus with all it had to offer, and the book of Revelations portrayed him as falling from heaven and into the pit of hell, bringing one third of the stars or angels down with him, similar to the fallen angels in the book of Enoch. In the show, it's not confirmed if Satan and the other royals of hell will be angels or natives to hell, and in a Patreon Q&A, series writer Adam Nalen confirmed that the writers had had not quite decided which would be the case, leaving it open as they developed the lore, perhaps to see what will just best fit in the end. This may have changed since then, but the characters had already been developed without that in mind, and as such, this is not something we can decode using clues from the show. However, we can explore what those two different options might mean in terms of the existing lore. Now, ultimately, whether or not they are angels from heaven or native powerful entities from hell, they are angels in some sense, as hell was created from Lucifer seemingly connecting the world to the concept of evil, with heaven being a manifestation of the concept of good. So even if Satan, Beelzebub, and the others are natives to hell instead of angels, they could still be considered of equal power and stature in their own terrain, beings who are essentially the same as angels, but from the essence of darkness instead of from the essence of light like the angels seem to be. One level below Satan in the Wrath Ring is Beelzebub in the Gluttony Ring. In the show, Beelzebub is presented as female, but traditionally is not just male, but often considered the same character as Satan or Lucifer, being the devil. Because of that, the three demons have also been listed together as a sort of unholy trinity in various writings to parallel the holy trinity of the church. Like Satan and Lucifer, however, Beelzebub gets her name from her own unique origin. Beelzebub, or Baalzebub, came from the root word Baal, meaning Lord. This term was used for chief gods like El, and in fact, Baal could also be pronounced Baal. Because Baal was a common name for gods in the ancient Near East, the term Baalzebub would develop, meaning Lord of the Flies, to demonize those other gods. In the Gluttony Ring, Beelzebub rules over the Hellhounds, who are famous from real-life legends as demons who come up from Hell in order to drag doomed souls back down with them. This is why Hellhounds like Luna are able to scope out their exact targets in the show, this being some sort of demonic evolutionary trait that Hell has taken advantage of to conquer the Earth. Another ring down, we have the Greed Ring with its green sky. This ring is ruled by Mammon, the demon embodying the sin of greed. Mammon, as a word, originally meant the love of money, and in the Bible was personified as an entity in metaphor, leading to the name being used as a demon representing greed as a whole later on. The inspiration for Mammon as a jester-themed demon likely comes from the demon entity Lucifuge, with Lucifer meaning Lightbringer and Lucifuge meaning Fugitive from the Light. This demon was depicted wearing a jester's outfit and was said to be in charge of the Bank of Hell, such as Mammon is in the show. His ring is primarily home to loan sharks who don't have real-life equivalents and instead just work as a mafia group of hell who exploit the poor populations with high-interest loans. They take advantage of a population of imps that have moved into the greed ring at some point in the past, letting them have all the low-wage jobs in the factories that help bring more wealth into the greed ring but not into the pockets of the workers. We also see what looks like dinosaur-themed demons in the background of this ring, such as Triceratops, Pterodactyls, and others. Considering sharks are about as old as dinosaurs, it makes sense that they'd all exist in this ring, where perhaps not much has changed since they happen to evolve into these forms. Another ring down with its blue sky is Lust, ruled by Osmodius. Osmodius is interesting because he is not just the embodiment of Lust and thus the ruler of the Lust Ring, but he is also a king in the Ars Goetia, the second form of nobility that we will be getting into more detail later on. Osmodius is among the most important characters we've seen in regards to how the demons influence the Earth, and it's interesting 
saying that the way they do this seems to go against what Lucifer should be okay with, or what he should allow, but we don't entirely know why yet, though I will give some theories on this later as well. Envy is the one ring we have not seen, though from the Peter Binsfield list we know it to be ruled by Leviathan. Leviathan is well known as a biblical sea monster, and through a process of elimination, the species that is native there appears to be deep sea fish demons that glow in the dark. This has made some fans assume that this will be a very dark ring, not just because of the dark purple color its sky is implied to have through the maps of the rings of hell and such, but because potentially it will also just be one giant deep sea ocean, a place that the other species cannot travel to, at least without some effort. Leviathan is a symbol often used to represent a sort of primordial chaos and times of turmoil before God created order in the world, and of all the demon princes, I think Leviathan is the most likely to point to origins from deeper within hell instead of being fallen angels. But finally, we have the Sloth Ring with its pink skies ruled by Belphegor. Belphegor is not seen on screen yet, but is believed to be, as the embodiment of Sloth, extremely lazy, indulging in a variety of prescription drugs to get through the day that she then markets to the masses of hell. Some fans speculate that Belphegor will be combined with Baphomet, the alleged deity worshipped by the Knights Templar. While I found no connection between them in real life, this ring is run by a species of demons that look like Baphomet with candles on their heads, and the princes of each ring seem to have some sort of connection to their species. For now, however, this is just a theory, and in fact, Baphomet may end up just being their own unique entity. Regardless of if these six sins are all angels or all demons, or a combination of the two, they are all very separate from Lucifer. Lucifer's sin is pride, and he embodies that in a sense, but he doesn't do things that are traditionally evil the way the others seem to. He looks down at the sinners who receive free will and used it to act sinful, and Lucifer is being punished in his own mind just for thinking that the humans might be capable of being better with free will. The other sins, however, seem to actually enjoy indulging in their sin and the sin of the masses. While Lucifer may actually argue for less sinful action in hell overall, the others have markets that rely on sin, as well as infecting the rest of hell with sin and even the earth. Mammon in particular is famous for how he exploits hell, even milking Lucifer for what he can. While it's not shown in Has Been Hotel, Lucifer was shown in Hell of a Boss to have his own theme park called Lulu World. This was so successful for Lucifer that Mammon thought he could make money by simply ripping it off with his own version in the greed ring called Lulu Land, which caters exclusively to Hellborn since sinners are isolated to pride. Lucifer tried to sue Mammon for trademark infringement, but the courts of Hell actually sided with Mammon on this, and he gets to play the victim while ripping off Lucifer. Mammon claims in these documents that he is close friends with Lucifer, but he's very clearly happy to sabotage him for profit, and really all of Hell as a whole. Especially especially in his own ring. Beelzebub talks about the other sins as if they are family, however, though doesn't mention Mammon in particular, and even complains about Belphegor. Osmodius, meanwhile, spreads lust not just around Hell, but up on Earth, and interfering with Earth is what got Lucifer sent to Hell to begin with. Osmodius does this, it would seem, for the Ars Goetia, the second system of nobility made up of 72 demons, with Osmodius being just one of its kings. The only character we know of that may be above him in the Ars Goetia so far is Paimon, who is a king like Osmodius, but seems a lot more focused on his duties as a Goetia. Paimon is the father of Stolas, who is just a prince, but who is entrusted with the duty of decoding the prophecies surrounding the stars of the Earth in particular. These prophecies in our mystic texts are about the end times, such as the Book of Revelations, which is filled with astrological symbolism. These end times are meant to be the end of life as we know it, with the demons of hell coming out of their pit to do battle with the angels of heaven. Traditionally, this is understood to be the devil, who would be Lucifer, though in the Book of Revelations, he is of course called Satan. Now, Paimon and the Goetia, like Satan and the Six Sins discussed before, were not developed with any plan as to whether or not they will be fallen angels like Lucifer, or natives to hell of similar but ultimately lesser power. So instead of looking for clues that would prove one or another, we're going to use what we do know in the show to talk about how each would play out. Osmodius said he had known Mammon since hell first started, and if they were angels, that would mean that they first really got to know each other after being banished into hell. Lucifer may not have been the only angel to interfere with the earth. He may have given the humans free will, but Mammon and Osmodius could have also been going down there to spread lust and greed. Lucifer was said to create hell with his actions in the show, but since he was thrown into the pit, there would be no reason not to throw other angels from heaven in there with Lucifer as well, other angels who had transgressed in their own way, becoming fallen such as Sarah warns Emily of. 
If they were natives to hell, however, they would also simply manifest in hell when it came into existence, and thus would know each other as powerful entities from the very beginning. As of now, there is no real reason why the other sins, and the Goetia in particular, would want to continue coming after the Earth if they were angels, as they don't rule pride or have control over sinners, with their own markets such as Osmodius being kept safe by not interacting with the humans that the Goetia help sabotage so they can go to hell. While the Sins and Goetia are generally written in real life to be angels or the descendants of angels, it is more interesting to the lore of the Helliverse in my opinion if they are natives to hell who never lived in heaven. This would explain why they continue to haunt earth and spread sin, and why they are so concerned about the eventual conflict with heaven despite natives being ignored by the actual extermination. The angels were said in Charlie's narration of her storybook to have shielded existence from evil, and Lucifer's actions creating hell seemed to sabotage that. It was by giving humans the free will to understand evil that they allowed evil to seep into reality, and seemingly what gave evil permission to interfere with the earth the way angels like Lucifer had. It makes sense to me then that the leaders of hell who are trying to conquer earth would be natives to hell and not angels from heaven who went to hell like Lucifer. They could look so much like angels in some cases, such as the Ars Goetia in particular, because they are both simply natural manifestations of higher level beings just from different moral sources, good and evil. Either way, the lore is set up that these royals are essentially angels, the only real distinction being whether or not they were angels who fell from heaven or were born in such a fallen state in hell. To stem from the source of evil, however, while interesting, doesn't quite explain why Lucifer would allow that to happen or be equated with them as rulers of hell. And whatever direction the show goes with them, there will definitely need to be some sort of elaboration on why hell is simultaneously a prison where royals like Stolas can be killed by angelic weapons, but are also allowed to just interfere with the earth while being exempt from the extermination. But what do you guys think? Thanks for making it to the end of this very big video. We of course still have plenty of has-been hotel theories coming out the rest of this month. Just expect videos to go down to one every other day and for us to start probably slipping in more uh, videos about other cartoons in the meantime. Let me know all of your thoughts in the comments down below and I'll see you guys next time.